Good afternoon and welcome to the Docs with Disabilities, Women with Disabilities in Medicine Mentorship Panel. My name is Lisa Meeks and I am the Executive Director of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and I am thrilled to be able to host this event. Today's panel is the first in a series of such panels that will support our ongoing commitment to fostering inclusion and breaking down barriers within health professions training. This incredible group, including the co-chairs of our Women with Disabilities in Medicine program, Drs. Kessler and Dr. Sihas, will have curated this panel for you and will provide an incredible discussion today with trailblazing women from a myriad of intersecting identities and specialties to share their experiences. I'd like to extend a, a heartfelt uh, gratitude to our main sponsors, the Ford Foundation and the University of Michigan Center for Disability Health and Wellness, whose unwavering support has made this and future events possible. I'd also like to thank our entire community of co-sponsors, Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, the Association for Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss, Michigan Medicine Department of Family Medicine M Disability Program, the Johns Hopkins Disability Health Research Center, and the American Public Health Association Disability Section. All of these groups do so much for our collective disability community through their work and their advocacy, and we are grateful for them every day. Today, we embark on a journey of mentorship and empowerment as we seek to create a more inclusive and equitable future for the med for medical professionals. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Drs. Kessler and Sihas. Hi guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have such an amazing panel for you. I'm Dr. Allison Kessler. I'm a physiatrist in Chicago, which uh, and I take care of predominantly people with spinal cord injuries. And I also had a spinal cord injury and I'm a wheelchair user. And with that, I would like to have my co-chair introduce herself. Sure, hello. Uh, my name is Diana Sejas. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a, oh, visual description. Um, so I am a black woman whose hair is in kind of a curly Afro sort of thing that I could make it do today. Uh, I'm sitting in front of a wall of different colors of books. Um, also, I am trying very hard to keep a kitten out of the screen, but she is, struggling with me today. Um, but I am one of the co-chairs. I am so excited to be here. I'm a pediatric neurologist, particularly I'm a neurodevelopmentalist and I'm at the Carolina Institute for Developmental Disabilities and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm again, excited to be here. And I think um, I'll keep it short and try to ask our panelists if they'd like to start introducing themselves. All right, Amy, let's start with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Rule. I am a neonatal and pediatric hospitalist at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. My visual description is that I am a white woman with brown hair, which is slightly unruly. So I have put it back in a uh, ponytail today in an attempt to uh, look professional for this panel. Um, and um, I have big eyes and I am smiling um, and I am excited to talk to you guys today. Um, I My connection to disability is that I have a rare skeletal dysplasia, so I have sort of intermittent uh, mobility disability. So I sometimes use a wheelchair and sometimes I use like a forearm crutch or whatever else kind of floats my boat that day. And then I also have... Um, congenital hearing loss. So I wear hearing, eye, hearing aids and use an amplified um, stethoscope um, as part of my clinical practice. And I'll leave it at that. How about, uh, I'll call on my friend, Dr. Page to go next. Thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm Paige Church. I am a neonatologist and a developmental pediatrician. And I am at Beth Israel Deaconess and Boston Children's Hospital in Boston with my friend, Dr. Arnold. Um, my visual description is that I am a, a very tired looking 52 year old woman with glasses. Um, I just had surgery last month. So this is actually one of the first times I've washed my hair uh, in a month. And I'm sitting in our office because I'm still at home and not allowed to drive. 
Um, and I am smiling and excited to be on this panel. And my reason for being on the panel is I have a history of spina bifida and more or less I am ambulatory, um, but I do have um, significant bladder and bowel neurogenic um, issues and um, it impacts my clinical practice where I no longer do um, call and I am very much not doing procedures that much anymore for the um, reasons of just being able to stand for prolonged periods of time. Ashina? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ashna Singh. I am a transplant hepatologist and gastroenterologist at Indiana University. Uh, my visual description is middle-aged Indian woman, uh, long uh, black and gray hair now, um, and uh, I'm uh, wearing uh, long earrings. Um, my disability is uh, I've had chronic illness with ulcerative colitis uh, since the age of 15, but uh, in the middle of my GI fellowship, developed uh, sudden hearing loss um, and do wear bilateral hearing aids, um, as well as using a Roger mic, as well as using an amplified stethoscope um, to go about my day um, at work. Uh, I am very excited to be here. Jennifer? Hi, everyone. Really great to be here. My name is Jennifer Arnold, and I am... Um, go by she, her, hers are my pronouns. Um, uh, my physical, uh, well, I, let me tell you my first, my role is at Boston Children's Hospital. So I'm in the same city and neighboring hospital and same hospital at times as Paige. I'm looking forward to connecting with Paige here. I'm new to the Boston area. I, I am program director of our simulation program, but I'm also clinically a neonatologist. However, uh, due to my physical disability, I only do limited clinical care at this point. Um, my uh, physical description is I'm a short statured uh, woman, white woman with blonde, not naturally uh, highlighted hair, and I wear glasses and I'm smiling, um, sitting in my home office uh, wearing a colorful scarf today. Um, super excited about this opportunity to be a part of this panel of amazing uh, female physicians and um uh, what else can I say? I, my disability is uh, a skeletal dysplasia, a rare one that results not only in short stature, but in mobility issues. I sometimes use a scooter for long distance um, and have uh, had a lot of uh, osteoarthritis. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much. And Sylvia. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sylvia Robinson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm based in Chicago. I have an internal medicine and pediatric uh, trained physician. Um, then went on to do pediatric endocrinology. Currently have a very um, uh, strong interest in uh, obesity medicine, health equity, and um, how I can best uh, help everyone and the, the members of my community. Um, right now, I am um, mainly doing locums work with the plan to tr transition back into academics um, in the near future. And in terms of my virtual description, before I get into um, my disability, I am, it looks, I feel like it looks I'm, like I'm wearing black right now, but it's actually a burgundy sweater. And um, I have uh, curly hair right now. I'm wearing my favorite black glasses. And I feel like my background is kind of groovy. I feel like it's calming and just chill. So um, in terms of my disability, I have a diagnosis of um, inattentive ADHD. And it was a late, um, a late diagnosis. Got it pretty um, in, in my 30s. Uh, and so it... Um, in, in some ways, depending on which situation um, I am in and, and what I'm doing, I have to kind of change up what I may need um, in terms of uh, the things that uh, I ask for to make me successful. So it's still a work in progress, but happy to be here and I'm excited to hear everybody's input and conversation. So Sylvia, let's stick with you for a moment. Our first question that we're gonna start with today is, around disclosure. So did you disclose 
anything about your disability or accommodations that you might have wanted during your training. And so um, I think, so initially I'm gonna um, ask if um, Ashna can start first and then I'll chime in afterwards since we have a little bit different experience. Yeah, um, so happy to happy to take this one on. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my introduction, I was diagnosed with uh, my sensory disability in the middle of my training. Um, you know, I had slowly been on a research rotation where I didn't have to interact as much in the hospital system where, there, you know, there was a lot of background noise and didn't realize until I went back on the wards that I was really having a lot of difficulty doing my job, my daily um, work. Um, and so was diagnosed in the middle of fellowship. So it was really hard for me to keep that a secret. Um, uh, but, you know, I had thankfully chosen an environment, probably also in part because of my chronic illness, where I knew the place that I was training was a supportive place um, uh, that would help me, you know, come what may. And um, so this happened and, um, you know, between employee health and GME and my program director, everyone was so supportive. They didn't know how to support me because this, uh, it was the first time they had a learner with a, a hearing disability, but they were more than willing to give me the tools to, to um, do what I needed to do um, with a pager amplifier, with, you know, um, uh, different masks uh, so I could hear an endoscopy um, better. Uh, and so they were very supportive. With that said, you know, I went on to do another fellowship at another institution. Um, and I think uh, a little bit like um, Dr. Robinson, I, I had uh, so a lot of worry about disclosing when I went on interviews for my transplant fellowship um, in regards to my disability. And by then I had gotten hearing aids, I had kind of learned how to manage. And so I didn't disclose during my interview process, but as soon as I got the, accepted and took on a position, I did disclose. Um, and so a lot of factors went into it. Um, you know, I recently just switched jobs. Um, and so after six and a half years of being in my prior position, I moved to IU and um, I was completely transparent throughout all of my interviews that I went on this time uh, around. So obviously different stages of uh, training um, and along the way, but um, that, that's been my experience. All right. And so um, with regard to me, I think I went through some uh, initial early stages after getting my diagnosis of one, feeling a sense of um, relief that I finally had an answer sometimes for why things were a little bit harder for me. And so um, I'm not sure about everybody else, but I had certain pre preconceived notions about ADHD and kind of how it presented and how um you know, it, it might be managed and manifest. So um, I really started to do a lot of um, learning more about myself, learning more about the diagnosis. And depending on, you know, certain advice you may get initially, um, my initial thinking was, I'm going to implement these um, sometimes tips, tricks, um, not necessarily tricks, but things on my own. And in that way, like I may not need to disclose since it was such a, a newer diagnosis. So I'm going to try this first and then I probably won't need to disclose. Everybody has varying disabilities of how, I mean, varying um, kind of presentations of how uh, much ADHD does or doesn't like impact their daily lives. And um, so uh, started out with that and kind of over, over the course of time, you get to a point where you realize that it can't just be you <laughs> kind of helping to navigate how well you're able to uh, handle things and contribute to uh, your institution or organization. And so um, when I did finally realize uh, that I was already, you know, in, in my position um, at the time. And so there were worries, right, um, that um, just disclosing, because I'd already experienced in some other areas, right, where I disclosed and people were like, oh, no, I don't think you have that. Like you've been so successful. Um, you've done so well, um, which kind of made me second guess um, things that were going on. So it took a while for me to come to terms with um, 
with my diagnosis and, and what I might need. And so after that, I felt uh, more comfortable bringing it up. And um, one of the other issues I had, so usually when you disclose, the next question automatically is gonna be, do you require accommodations? And initially I did know what I needed. And so then I'm like, I don't wanna come into the situation disclosing and they're gonna look to me to kind of understand what, what I need and I don't know that yet. And so that uh, delayed some things uh, as well. But um, I've just come to find out that, you know, you don't have to have all the answers, right, of what you need to be successful, but you need each party to be willing to take on the challenge of, of coming up with things that, that help. And um, I'll stop talking now, but that's a little bit about my experience and disclosure. So this this question is also really resonating with me, even though I know I'm supposed to be the one answering the or asking the questions. Um, so I realized I forgot to mention my own disability. Um, I'm a cancer survivor, a stroke survivor. I had my critical illness while I was in residency. So a disclosure is something that's very personal. Um, when I first got sick, I remember trying to, or not when I first got sick, that's a whole other story, but when I first got my diagnosis, um, I think at first I tried to keep it as close to the vest as possible. I was still trying to understand uh, what my cancer diagnosis meant. I had a very long diagnostic journey. It really took me about five years to get a correct diagnosis and then found out that I had the cancer. So at first I tried to tell as few people as possible, only the people who really needed to know, my program director, because again, I was in the middle of my residency training when all of this was going on. Um, and um, I think a couple of my chief resident, but I quickly learned that I couldn't keep some things to myself because it was a very small program because people were wanting to know why the call schedule needed to be changed, why I was going to be out and what have you. Um, I ended up, I was getting most of my care in the hospital in which I trained, which had its own set of issues, I guess, around how comfortable people felt with me sharing information about my own health and my particular situation. Um, so I really feel like I had a loss of control around disclosure in some aspects related to some of my care and had a lot of really complicated feelings about that for a while. Um, once I, uh, I was in my pediatric residency training program at first, um, and then when it came time for me to graduate, because, you know, this was most of the third year of my peds residency, and go on to my neurology training program, I said, okay, I'm going to try to take some power back. I'm going to decide when I disclose, where I disclose, and to whom I disclose. I was very, very nervous about it. But luckily for me, I think I ended up in a program that just so happened to have a lot of disabled and chronically ill um, uh, attendings, whether they identify with that term or not. And as soon as I said, hey, this is what I need, I remember being so scared to disclose to my program director about needing accommodations. Specifically, I needed some dictation software. And he was like, well, do you just want to use the same one that I use? Or is there a different one that you would prefer? So it was, we were all able to have like a different level of conversation because he didn't see my request as something like absurd, honestly. Um, he just saw it as something that I needed to be able to do the work that I was doing. And I think that after being in a space where I was allowed to disclose without repercussions made me feel much more comfortable, made me feel much more safe and made me feel a lot you know, better about sharing my story and disclosing not just you know, on a need to know kind of a basis, but being a lot more open about my own disability within the workplace. And I know that we have a lot of follow-up questions. It's amazing to see these rolling in. Um, I don't know if we wanted to take one really quickly and then move on to the next one, but at the same time, I feel like we'd have so much to go through. Well, maybe one that spans a couple of different questions that have been put out there. A couple of people have asked about, you know, if you, how do you kind of figure out someone, I think, Ashina, I think you said that you feel really supported in your, you felt supported in your environment. And so some people are asking how do you find an environment where you think you will be supported without actually disclosing your disability? One person specifically phrased it that way, but a few other people also kind of said, how do you interview and try to find a, feel a place out again if you're not ready to take that next step? Does anybody on our panel kind of have some suggestions for how to look for a place where you feel that you will eventually be able to 
comfortably disclose and kind of ask for accommodations. I think, um, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I think, you know, you can get a sense of it when you're interviewing and you're having discussions and you sort of look around, you can ask, you know, just even look at your peers, people that are in the group, um, try to look to them to see if there's anything you can ask about, you know, family leave can be one way to sort of soft float how flexible they are, um, you know, things like that. It is a very delicate discussion and I think it's an important discussion and quite frankly, uh, the next question is going to be, what would you do differently? I wish I hadn't been so ashamed and quiet when I was looking, um, but I was. So I understand the fear and the um, and the concern. But I think there are unwritten, subtle things that you can look for when you're interviewing to look for those answers. And then I was also going to say, so the first place I would usually start is um, the website. Sometimes you can get a good sense of um, what support there is, and at least, you know, on the surface, what what um kind of the the protocol or, or process looks like depending on what's there and during um interviews i usually couch things in terms of you know i have a great in, interest strong interest in health equity so you know how i'll uh, just asking you know, generally speaking do you have any trainees with any um disabilities uh that one would be willing to you know talk about that or two um what are things that you've done to make them feel supported and important? That doesn't necessarily mean you have a, a disability, but you know, if that's something um, that you champion, it's a way to, to kind of couch that in, in your initial questions. Um, how are you um, supporting and um, helping these, uh, these different groups, whether that's patients or actual trainees in your program? So I think these are great responses. Uh, maybe we should move on to the next question so that we have time to get to everything. There's so much. Um, for this one, if you could go back in time to the beginning of your career in medicine, what advice would you give yourself? Um, and I wonder who would like to start with that one? Amy, do you want me to oh, page? Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, sorry. Um, well, okay, so I'll I'll just start off. I feel like there's lots of things that I wish I could go back in time and tell my younger self um, when I was just getting involved in medicine, but I'll just sort of limit it to, to two big themes that I, I, I think I wish I had known. I think the first is that medicine is a really um, diverse field. And so what I think I didn't realize is how many different applications, how many things you can do with a career in medicine. And so when others were telling me that it's too physically demanding or, you know, I wouldn't get in, I, I wish I had known that, you know, my fear was, okay, if I were to get in and then if I couldn't do it, what am I going to do? And so I was really worried about that. And I, I think that for me, like just knowing that it's such a diverse field and there's so much you can do um, would be one piece of advice. And then the second piece of advice is that um, I think I wish I had known that just being who I am is enough for the field of medicine. Because again, I think when I was applying to medical school, the majority of people told me I shouldn't or couldn't. I didn't know anyone else who was a little person who was a physician when I was applying. And I really feared that maybe I wouldn't be good enough or I wouldn't contribute enough. Um, and so I have come to find that, again, as I've gotten older, that um, there is so much that I think we offer to our patients from our perspective, from our lived experiences as individuals with disabilities, that I, I, I feel like I've seen connections made with patients that others couldn't and, and opportunities to have an impact you know, maybe maybe differently or um, even even better than others who may not have gone through similar life experiences. And so um, I guess I would just say, you know, remind my, or I wish I had known that just being who I am, you know, wanting to go into this field, um, working hard is enough, should be enough, and that I didn't have to potentially even overcompensate as much as I did to try and overcome um, what I thought the perceptions were as an individual going into medicine with a disability. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. I, I thought about this question a lot. I think that 
the biggest thing I would have liked to have told myself is forgive yourself and embrace who you are because my condition is not as physically obvious. Um, it takes a lot of work to make it uh, that way. Um, but for whatever reason, I felt that that somehow made it that I didn't have any right to ask for anything else because uh, I looked like most people. Um, and it was like a duck, you know, on the surface, I looked like, okay, but underneath, I was really, 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 really working hard to be just alive. And over time, I became very, very, very angry and very judgmental, um, very frustrated with how much energy it was taking for me to go to work. And if someone didn't show up, why not? I was there. Um, I wish a long time ago, someone had told me that I was going to offer a lot more value for what I had as my hidden story. Um, because once I did finally decide to write about it and write about it um, in an editorial, I felt so much calmer, so much safer, and um, so much more authentic and, and happier. And I think I've contributed more in the five years or six years since I published that than I did in the 15 years prior to that publication. So I think embrace what you have to offer. Chances are there's someone out there in the world who has something similar or maybe not, but sees the value in what you bring to the table and the value of your experience in the healthcare system as a user of it, that's so important. And people want to see that and, and I think really embrace it. So I think like Jennifer said, it makes our conversations with our patients richer and, and more um, real if we are true. So our next question for our panelists is either during training or even in practice now, have you experienced any either inappropriate questions or comments about your disability? And if you could talk to us a little bit about how you navigated that situation, maybe Amy, we could start with you. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, going back to the disclosure question and this question, I have a very visible disability. If you, um, to the uh, trained physician eye, somebody can see me across the room and realize that I have some sort of uh, something going on genetically. And then if I start to walk or if I start to move in my mobility device, it's really obvious that I have a disability. So on the one hand, I did not have to like think too much about disclosure most of the time because it was it was there. I I was I was all there out in the open. Um, uh, however, I think that I did experience a lot of, I don't even really call them microaggressions at this point. I think they're just straight up aggressions um, or interesting commentary about my existence. Um, and I found that this was particularly true in training. Uh, I still have, you know, encounters in my everyday life as an attending, but they were definitely about like a higher incidence on a daily basis when I was in training. Um, these spanned everywhere from uh, the hospital elevator, where I had a um, a surgery attending ask me, wait, are you a med student here? How in the world are you ever going to pass your surgical clerkship? Um, and I was a fourth year by this point. And so I was like, oh, I already did that. It went great. And then I got off on my floor. Um, and I like look back and I'm like, you know, should I have used that as some sort of like teaching moment? Like that was the response that like came to me at that moment in an elevator when this unsolicited, you know, encounter happened. I had some other encounters too that felt a lot more pressured or um, sort of more high stakes. Um, I knew that I was really interested in pediatrics and specifically academic peds um, pretty early on. And so when I was on my third year pediatric clerkship, um, I had a really important um, sort of professor at my institution um, in the middle of a teaching session, like turned to me and was like, hey, Amy, what page are you on in Smith's book, which is like the um, sort of genetics Bible and pediatrics of various um, genetic variants and syndrome. Um, and I was like stunned, stunned because this would happen in real life. Um, and I had absolutely no idea um in the moment like how to respond and I knew that this person would potentially write me a letter someday because he was a big name in that department um and so I knew that whatever answer came out of my mouth I needed to be the right one and I had no idea what the right answer was they had a colleague a sweet friend who I had known as a pre-med at the same institution and then we were in medical school together and he he knew that like one of my biggest fears um, or not biggest, biggest like sort of social fears was that I would walk into a medical lecture and there would be a naked Amy picture. And so to sort of break my like terrible silence of this like macro aggression, 
he like leaned over and whispered he's like I checked it's not you on the page and I think you're in the 300s um and that it may seem like that was an inappropriate comment but he was a close friend and he like knew some of the things flashing through my brain and he broke that ice and I was like I don't really know Dr. So-and-so but can we get back to learning about hyperbilirubinemia I would really like to learn about hyperbilirubinemia now um, so those are just some examples of things that happened to me in real life um, in medical school. Um, and I don't know if I had the right answer. And I look back at like what I would tell myself to say now. Um, I think I would give myself more grace in the sense that like those folks had absolutely no idea to, or no um, right to have any answer out of me or to have some sort of perceived power um, over my life. So I would tell myself that I, I didn't need to have the right answer. The right answer is that this comment should not have happened and I should be able to exit that situation um, more. So um, yeah, I guess I'll pass it off to uh, Jen and see what uh, experiences she has to share. Thank you, Amy. And Amy, I um I just want to say that I feel you on the fear of being on the slide deck of your medical school class because I also went to medical school where I was once a patient and um you know they had a one lecture on skeletal plagias and I thought please please let it not be me on the, <laughs> the example for my my condition so thankfully it wasn't um yes so I guess you know to add on I think I, I feel like I've had a lot of similar experiences Amy as you and I think maybe to highlight a different experience um, is, is sort of something that happened to me in practice. So I, I definitely would say I had my fair share of inappropriate comments, sometimes seemingly accidental people laughing, things like that, other uh, surgeons in the elevator laughing at you, that kind of thing. Um, I've had that. And I think up until I became, you know, maybe a little bit older or experienced in practice, I would sort of, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and try to use it as an educational opportunity, right? And be positive and resilient. And, and then something happened to me as an attending and I thought, oh, this is like the worst, you know, the situation I've been in. And it's almost surprising to me that when I was applying to med school, as hard as it was, and as much as I got rejected, I didn't have at least my awareness and blatant in my face, sort of um, just almost discriminatory uh, experiences this. And so I'll share with you, um, in one of my recent institutions, I was getting credentialed to work in the, na the connected neighboring hospital where deliveries uh, occurred. Um, and you know, our hospital as a children's hospital didn't have deliveries, but it was uh, the third floor of our building where they happened. And as I was getting, I got credential to start, you know, as part of our neonatal, t you know, um, department or division to be able to go and attend deliveries. Um, I, I I ended up getting assigned my first couple of, you know, months of service. And I said, hey, you know, that that time is really soon. I said, I just need to make sure that we get step stools in all of the delivery rooms you know, um, before I'm on service in the delivery room, because that would be bad. And I got no response for a day or two from our head of neonatology. And then I got an email that's from the medical director that said, I'm so sorry, Jen, um, it turns out that the institution is not willing or able to purchase and or maintain step stools in the delivery room. So we won't be able to um, have you do delivery room service. Um, I, I have to tell you, this is not that long ago. Um, and I was really quite taken aback. So my re initial response was anger. I mean, I was probably a little emotional. I was kind of really surprised that this would even be in an email. I kind of thought, is that something that's legally even allowed in this day and age? I've clearly already been practicing and, and done delivery room service and had step stools available and it, you know they cost thirty dollars right and so it just seemed like a really reasonable accommodation um and I didn't know how to respond and so what I ended up doing and maybe this is uh, I don't know if this is good advice or not for others who may be experiencing this is I took a couple of days just to synthesize it think about it come down from the emotion and then um, I actually ended up engaging with a, a, a friend of mine who was a disability lawyer. Um, and I asked her for advice. I said, I've never had something that I felt was truly discriminatory. How should I handle this? And she ended up giving me advice on how to, how to handle that situation. In the end, 
I wrote back an email because I learned that you have to give an opportunity for them to correct the error. And I wrote back a, you know, a really well-crafted email saying how I felt this was a reasonable accommodation. And I didn't quite understand, you know, understand why that would be a concern. And Anyways, the one thing that I did wrong that I, I would recommend not doing is I even offered to purchase the step stools myself, right? Because I was just so like taken aback by this and um, should have done that. And in the end, um, they did, it took them three months to figure it out, but they did decide that they were going to purchase step stools. Um, but I decided to leave the organization after that. So you can imagine that really kind of helped um me with my difficult decision to even stay in that organization, not because of just the, the the pure act of what happened, but because my my leadership didn't even advocate for me on behalf of the hospital. So um, I think these situations can be hard. It's not only the indiscretion itself, but there's also not that that unsureness of whether or not you're going to have advocacy at the people that you are closest with. And if you feel like you don't have an advocate. I think then, um, then, then it's really hard to have faith in the institution. So that was a rough experience, but I learned a lot from it. And I hope maybe sharing my experience will help others. So moving on for our question four, um, what advice would you give trainees about um, navigating disability related needs when entering the job market. Maybe Amy, we could start with you. I don't have the perfect answer to this, um, but I can share a little bit about my experience. Um, I will say that when I graduated from fellowship, um, I was really, really nervous about this. I um, I already shared that medical school, I had some interesting encounters. Um, residency was actually a really good time for me and felt I stayed at the same institution for fellowship and um, they had been really supportive and they made what felt like really big hurdles in medical school feel like somewhat easy and almost, uh, almost painless um, in residency and fellowship. And so I was really anxious about going into the job market and one of the biggest um, accommodations that I have is just around um, some preferential scheduling to make sure that my calls and my service weeks are sort of evenly distributed um, because of my um, mobility and my sort of chronic pain from my underlying uh, cartilage issues. Um, and so I was really worried. I'm like, how do I have that conversation? Um, and so one of the things that I did, which I think a lot of women in medicine do for a lot of different reasons, is that I did not take a 1.0 FTE um, in my first job. And at the time, you know, I also um, welcomed two children to our family, one uh, uh, from my body and then one for adoption in the course of like three or four years. And I have no regrets of like having a little bit more time there. But I also realized that I took a pay cut. And rather than necessarily have some of maybe the harder conversations um, with division chairs, um, you know, so I, when I took my second job, which I just started 16 months ago, um, I tried to be a little bit more intentional about laying out like, you know, these are the things that I'm bringing to this, you know, position. And, um, and it certainly was a little easier to do that in sort of a more mid-career role where I was being recruited for certain academic things. But still, like, this is the amount of protected time and I think I'm going to need for these roles. These are some of the things that I think I can bring um, to your division. Um, and I finally was, like, brave enough to even say, you know, and I have a disability and I'm really involved in DEI in the following ways and I would be willing to contribute in this as well. Um, and so really try to, like, instead of starting with, I need this because of this reason with my disability in that job interview, instead making it more of an asset based asset based conversation with that division chair. These are the things I can bring, including the fact that I have this lived experience as a patient and also as a parent. My son has my skills to dysplasia as well. Um, and that's something I bring, but uh, making it more about that rather than really focusing on um, the accommodations. So. And I'll say just to um, kind of add to that, I think um, how you navigate navigate the situation and the, the process that you take kind of depends on where you are in your process. Um, over time, I think you become more um, 
you, you learn more about yourself. You become more confident about the things that you need and that you require. And um, you learn a little bit more about what things are um, are important to you. So I know, uh, given I have a couple different uh, marginalized um, identities, so there's always a tendency for um, me to try and um, not be different, not draw attention um, to myself um, and, you know, not not be seen as a, a, a burden. And um, just coming to the, the, the realization is that, so it, kind of reframing my thinking, it's not that I'm asking for, um, for more or that, um, you know, be, just because everybody else doesn't need it, that it's somehow um, appropriate then to say that like nobody else, you know, should get this things, just coming to it more from a standpoint of um, these are the things that I need to be uh, productive member of this this team and this organization. And I think that one just comes with um, self-discovery over time and and, com- and confidence. So um, when mentees or different people kind of um, ask me about disclosing, um, you know, we sit there, we kind of weigh the, the pros and cons of that decision. So, you know, what are some of the pros of of disclosing one, it gives that institution time to plan for when you arrive and better prepare um, and how they can be helpful uh, to you in the future. Um, it also, you know, I think takes a weight off of you, the person that's coming in. Um, there are certain times where I always, where I felt like um, not disclosing um, kind of meant that I was um, omitting or lying by omission because you didn't disclose, you know, before you started the position. And um, it's it's been just a, it's always going to be a, a learning process. My, my, when I've been applying for jobs most recently, I have made the decision to initially to um, disclose to HR at the time of the application. Now, I have not made the decision to like put these things in, in my CVs or cover letters, um, but I do that initial uh, disclosure. And then um, as I'm going through the process, decide how you know safe or not I feel to, to disclose further while they're getting to know me and I'm, I'm getting to know them. Um, and so that's kind of what, where I am right now in the process. In the future, it may be that you know, at a certain point, I just want it all out there, out there on the table. So if, if there's going to be a problem where you're not interested in, in having me because I have this disability, then, you know, there's nothing we even need to, to discuss moving forward with the, the interview process. And I think that just comes, comes with time. And um, yeah, it'll depend on where you are and um, what, what your experience has been. Um, I will say that, and my last point that, um, whether or not to disclose has also been sometimes predicated on how easy I feel like the process is when with earlier, earlier and with trainees, um, sometimes you just don't know like who you're supposed to disclose to. Like if you're a medical student and you're on rotations, are you supposed to disclose to everybody that you go through on that two week rotation? That can take a lot out of you. You're constantly having to explain what the issue is and what you need. Um, versus just kind of trying to uh, struggle through it. So I think in general, there's a lot of work that can be done in the future about making that process not so one-sided um, with the caveat that, you know, this is your health and medical history. You have some say in how it's released, but I think we could do a better job overall of making the process less confusing. So these are great Great answers and great discussion that we're having today. Um, the next question uh, is, how did you choose your specialty? Um, so I'm going to chime in on that one. You know, I had already been living with chronic illness, um, like many of my um, uh, colleagues here, uh, for several years before I developed the hearing loss. So I had kind of already picked a specialty that I knew was, while procedural-based, while call-based, um, uh, 
while requiring a lot of multidisciplinary interaction, um, I um, knew that it, I could see different permutations of my career down the line if I was if my health was not to be as good as as it was when I was um, you know in training. Um, and so, you know, hepatology, you know, a specific subset of gastroenterology, you know, I, my career is not based on my ability to scope alone, um, you know, and, and so while I, that is a big part of what I do right now, it doesn't have to be five or 10 years from now. It doesn't have to be if, you know, if I choose it not to be. Um, and so um, that was, that did really go into part of how I chose that specialty. Um, I like doing procedures. I like the multidisciplinary nature of what I do. Um, and um, I chose it in part because of that. I think a lot of the other things are, you know, for me, um, in uh, disclosure of my disability and, and and kind of trying to adapt my environment and, and bring up the environment for everyone around me. Uh, you know, some of the things that I think make me a good transplant hepatologist um, helped me to do that and turn that around on myself. So advocacy, persistence, um, you know, on behalf of my patients, the guarded optimism that I have for my um, pre-liver transplant patients. I had to turn it around when, um, you know, I developed my hearing loss and I started to use that to normalize disability in my environment uh, amongst learners, amongst staff. Um, and to have us really take a kind of um, heat map of what we're doing, you know, in, in our uh, within what I did um, and where I worked. And um, that did help me, <laughs> um, you know, to stand up for myself, but also for others. And so um, I think that, you know, the other things that I've had to adapt to technology to help me do my job, um, something that wasn't natural to me to begin with, but now I have... Um, grown on that, uh, uh, you know, expertise and turned that into a clinical passion of mine. So I do clinical informatics and I've helped to roll that out for patients um, where I uh, previously worked and I'm currently, you know, in process of doing that where I am now, um, because I think that there's a lot we can use to improve delivery of care um, for both providers within, you know, with, between providers, but also um, to our patients. And so using what I've learned, you know, from all the technology I've had to use and adapt to do my job with my new disability, um, you know, to also help others, um, you know, my, our patients and other providers. Yeah, and I mean, for me, I, I was already living with my condition as I went through medical school and as I went through residency. So what I tried to do with my first piece of advice is you got to do what you love. These days are too long if you don't like the medicine you're practicing. <laughs> that is true. Um, but I would also say that you also, I personally, what I did, and I can't say it's what everyone should do, I tried to merge that with what I thought I could do now and what I could, thought I could do in 10 years. I was very mindful of the fact that my condition was one that would evolve and would progressively not be the same, and I would not have the same level of function. Um, so for example, I loved surgery. I thought it was really cool. I loved the technical aspects. I loved the handedness, but for me, especially with my bladder and bowel, like that was very quickly something that I also found in the background was a constant conversation. Could I get through the rotation? And, and my father was smart. He sat me down. He said, do you want to live like that? Do you want to live constantly calculating every day? And so try to merge your interest with your ability and your function and what you want your whole life to look like. And the other thing I'd say is we're all, we're all um, women or individuals. And so there's going to be other aspects of your life that are going to be important. That should be a factor. As you think about this, we get so caught up in the fun of medicine and, and the love of it. But my guess is that everyone on this panel and everyone attending this webinar has something else that they love other than medicine. And that should really be in the forefront of your mind as you think about your future, because Medicine should be important, but so should the things that make you joyful outside of medicine, because that's going to be your buoyancy device when medicine is hard. And so taking all of those things together and then going forward is what I would recommend as you think about your career choices. So kind of as like a follow up to this question, um, maybe one that we can spread to the entire group. Um, but what happens in the career that you selected? specialty that you selected, the, the practice that you're in needs to shift. How do you create a career that works for you, even if it looks different?
and while people think or oh go ahead go ahead Jen so I just it, you know it kind of came to me when you said that I, I think um I've made quite a pivot in my career going from you know a full-time clinician to now pretty much a full-time administrative educator with my simulation hat and I think um, kind of similar to Paige and that I was thinking ahead a little bit early on about what my longevity might be, not being 100% sure, but knowing that it might I might experience difficulty uh, maintaining a full clinical load as a neonatologist. So I ended up um, really just taking my, my career, adding on more and more simulation and finding that I enjoyed it. I enjoyed teaching. Um, but also what I loved about simulation is it still kept me feeling very clinical and very much um, close to frontline clinicians. And then even now pivoting towards giving simulation to patients and families. So that gives me more patient direct face time. And so I guess um, what I would say is be creative. And, you know, um, if you can think ahead and as you if you see things that other people are doing that maybe others are only doing at 20% of their time. I think, uh, you know, if you show the passion and you have the passion, you can make it more uh, a percentage of your time. Um, and so that's sort of how I pivoted. Just quickly, I think the best advice I ever got was fill your day or someone will fill it for you. So, uh, you know, if there's things you love, fill your day with those. And if as your career changes, start anticipating that those are the things you want to fill your days with, because nobody can fill them if they're already full and they're contributing. And I want to say, too, I think as all of our careers have evolved, we've found new interests and and new things that we want to dedicate our time to. And that may or may not have anything to do with our disability and also just phases of our lives as human beings who are learning and growing and possibly having kids. I'm putting that out there because I have two children um, and and what I choose to fill my day with can sometimes ebb and flow and change over time. And I think that's okay too. Um, we have to kind of meet ourselves where our emotional bodies are, where our physical bodies are and where our interests are. So even doing things like this is part of my day. Um, I don't know that I would have imagined myself doing this 10 years ago, um, but now being a, a co-lead for this project with Diana is just such a wonderful part of my day. I need to talk to you all. So I think uh, being open to change for all of us is also really important and really exciting as well. Yeah, sorry, okay. I have one thing, sorry. Yeah, um, go for it. Just um, the other great advice, I've got all these little pearls as, I, as I'm, I'm the old lady, I think in the group, but um, the other great advice I got was anything you do can be academic. You don't need to do a randomized control trial to be an academic. Um, you know, I've had that silly little editorial I wrote or that editorial I wrote that was, you know, not the most academic thing I've done has proven to be something that has taken me in more directions academically than half of the clinical trials I was a part of. So do what you love, have fun with it, fill your days, but also write about it, talk about it, do it. And if you do that, you're teaching and that's going to be academic and that's important and that will help other people learn from you. And you can put it on your academic CV. You absolutely can. Um, I wanted to jump on that and just say absolutely, like write about it. And you don't necessarily have to write like a peer reviewed manuscript. You don't necessarily have to write a commentary in an academic medical journal. I write about uh, illness, uh, disability a lot. Um, I do write academically, medical academic, but I also write creatively. And I have had so many more doors opened because someone will read an essay that I have written, a poem that I have written, and that resonates with them. And that's not just you know, patients and uh, people and the general public, it's also my colleagues where they will read something and think, hey, this is really something that I want to work on you with. And then that leads to, uh, you know, the traditional kinds of academic things like research publications, uh, different kind of projects that I'm on. So you can find your niche, uh, just figure out what it is that drives you. Writing is something that very much drives me and being creative and trying to figure out how to make sense of medicine with words. And I like to think that I found my little place in this world. And I think that other people can do that too, if you're true to yourself. And our last question before we try to answer some of your questions 
is, um, oh, now I have to scroll back up, I apologize. So our last question is, how do you take and filter advice to avoid following myths or antiquated ideas that might be perpetuated in healthcare? So um, I will start uh, answering this, this question um, because I feel like uh, over time after uh, getting diagnosed and I, generally speaking, um, the earlier you are in training, the less you know about um, medicine and uh, how what it will be like moving forward. Um, it's it's difficult to make uh, informed decisions from the advice that you receive. Um, earlier on, um, I I am a first uh, generation physician, so I didn't have a um, a great understanding of how things work or maybe things that I should consider um, starting off. And that came with more time and exposure um, to the field. But I've come to to find that um, you have to seek out multiple perspectives, number one. And I know sometimes that can be difficult because, um, because of things that we talked about here. Sometimes, right, it's not the easiest to disclose. So how do you know who can be helpful and um, who can provide you with, um, you know, different different um, options, different thoughts. Um, I try and always center uh, the advice that I get, um, starting with one, um, based on what I know about myself, um, is this advice or information going to help me get to where I need to be? Or uh, is it advice that maybe is just, given from from the perspective of fear like they they want me to not receive any uh, issues or problems and so they're giving me advice that um, they feel like you know is protecting me um or uh you know always people with, with lived experiences uh, are helpful because they can understand some of some of your concerns so i kind of take all of those things into account and try to find people that um either, even if it isn't the exact same experience as me, um, it's closer to that. And, you know, juxtapose that with someone who may not have the lived experience, but work with people that have the lived experience, have done a lot of um, research or input on that lived experience um, as well. And I think it it just comes with time. You know, there are certain instances, and I still see it today, where people will be like, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't disclose at all. Um, especially if you don't think you'll uh, need accommodations or you don't know if you will. And I don't think that is good advice for for the most part, right? Um, and like I said before, it's your decision and you'll figure out when you want to disclose, but saying don't disclose just because you may not need any services, I think is kind of leading them in the wrong, the wrong direction and, and wrong type of thinking or Others just just say, you know, work through things or you don't want to do this. It's going to, you know, cause you some bias. That may be true. Right. But are they leading you down a path to where you're going to start something under um, under the. Under situation, under things that are just going to prepare you to have issues in the future um, if you aren't. Um, if you can't uh, kind of keep up with whatever it is you, you've started. So um, that's kind of been my uh, experience and I'm happy to, or interested to hear what others might have. But I think our program is a, a great step in helping filter some of that advice. Shameless plug. It's interesting that you, that you say that, Sylvia. I think it's funny when I think back about some of the advice that I got as a medical student, especially when I was asking other people who were maybe only a couple of years ahead of me. Um, and this doesn't even have anything to do with my disability again, just sort of like which rotation or how to get a letter or, you know, what job should I pick? What was really funny was that a lot of people would give me this advice that made it sound like gospel, right? Um, you must do this. You have to do this. But it was very interesting because a lot of those people were still trainees themselves. And looking back and thinking about some of the things they told me to do or that this is what the world would look like now on the other side, being a practicing physician, 
I'm sort of like none of that is <laughs> uh, bears any resemblance to sort of my my everyday life. And so I think that um, from my perspective, if I could give people kind of one piece of advice that someone told me, and I feel like Paige thinking Nuggetable was uh, take everything in, but don't act on everything. So listen to everybody. They're sharing a perspective and it's good to hear other people's perspectives, but they're just that. They are perspectives that that person has based on their experiences and culture and background and it's filtered. And so listen to everything, but you ultimately have to pick what's right for you. And I would answer that as the same way that I am, that people were talking about, if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice, I think it would be to be less afraid to talk about it. Because what I find is that other people are afraid. And if I don't talk about it and they don't talk about it, it's a big, scary black box. And then nobody wants to deal with the unknown. And what I've found is that if I'm upfront and honest and discuss, I'm usually met with a lot more positive and support than if I wait until there's a problem 10 steps down the line. And that's taken a very long time for me to come to, though, because I used to be the person that didn't want to discuss any potential things that I couldn't do, or, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to admit that to myself, even that there were certain things that I might need help with. Um, and I, and I think coming to terms with every human being disability or not, is going to need a little bit of different support in different ways. I'm just asking for support in these specific ways has served me a lot better. Well, and I think the other thing is, Lisa, I mean, this is this is like we are the, the club. We are the people that Lisa pulled together with her brilliance. Take advantage of what we have done and learned. Like we are walking a walk or paving a path that may not have been done before. Use us, tap into us, ask us for help. We that's why we're all here, you know, like we're all and we're all talking to each other. So if you think that we're all doing this independently, we may have earlier on. But because of Lisa and because of these incredible people on this panel, we have all found each other and we're learning from each other. And we are getting stronger and more mighty by doing that than we ever were when we were alone. So take us and use us. So with that, I'd like to move into a few questions. So one of the questions that I'm reading in the chat said, can people share um, how you've seen implicit biases of colleagues and other medical professionals uh, and or patients impact your interactions and how did you address and process through these biases? And I can start if somebody else doesn't unmute, I can say part of, part of this is first, I had to understand what we all mean by these biases and I, and I learned this by starting to talk and give lectures and read and educate myself. And I realized I needed to educate, and I'm still not perfect. I'm learning every day and I learn from you all every day on this panel, so thank you. And by learning that, I realized I could help to then teach other people. And I used to be nervous that when I called out other people's biased or ableist comments, that they would then think that, oh, well, that's because you have a disability. And, and and I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to call attention to that disability. But conversely, what I found is that if you use it as a teaching opportunity, I've again been met with fairly positive responses. I had a student recently make a comment about, well, of course, that person would be depressed because of their, their new disability, their new injury. And um, I responded with, well, it's very interesting that you would say that. Why must they be depressed because of a disability? And I called it out and said, that is an ableist comment. But rather than attack them, I didn't. I said, let's let's talk about that. It's a really interesting comment. Let's learn from that. Let's discuss that. And um, I've sort of tried to move from sort of an attack or on myself or feeling defensive to using it as a teaching moment. And I can say I've had some positive responses from that, but I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel. 
Yeah, I've had some similar experiences with trainees of just trying to like almost reflect the comment back and then have a discussion about it. I think what I have found it's been harder is like when it's um when it's with my colleagues, right? Because then there's like a different power dynamic than when it's my you know trainees and on a round and around situation. Um, and you know I uh, actually wrote a paper about this. You know the in pediatrics we often will you know go back to our workroom and sometimes we will reflect on experiences and often in peds the reoccurring theme is that parent or that family. Um, and, you know, I felt like that when I became a parent, I realized how much of my own bias I had, even as a disabled person, um, about how I sometimes felt about, um, you know, families of children with um, complex health care needs and or disabilities. Um, and it was kind of similar to Allison in my own experiences, like the more I learned to unpack my own biases, the more I felt like I was able to contribute to teaching and conversations and writing about that. The other thing I would say is um, show up to the table where they're talking about bias, wherever it is in your institution or your training program. So, you know, volunteer if you have the bandwidth and the time, like to be on the diversity committee and make sure that disability and ableism is something that your institution or program is thinking about as well. And so I think showing up and being present is also important. You know, one of the um, one of the things I get a lot because I will often tell my patients that I, you know, I wear hearing aids so they're aware when I walk in the room and, um, you know, I, that I'm facing them and that they're facing me. Um, I get because I'm younger, um, they don't understand it doesn't process. You know, they're like, "What do you mean you can't hear me? You're, you're are you making a joke? Are you, you know?" And then I, I point to my hearing aids. You know, like, no, I'm I'm serious. I have difficulty hearing. So that, that's from the patient side, I get that from time to time. And, you know, I, I that was also a decision I made um, more recently that I was going to share that with them so that they knew, you know, what we what this relationship was going to look like and, and where my, you know, where, where some of, you know, my difficulty might be. When I get uh, one of the things that happened, you know, over the last few years in in my attendingship with my colleagues is sometimes I've I've become very vocal and very open about my disability, um, especially since COVID and with the you know uh, inception of all these virtual meetings and the requirements for you know transcripts and things like that that I had I needed, um, uh, but. I still get, you know, things like, well, why didn't you just pick up that phone and call that person about, you know, X, Y, or Z consult? And for a person who is hard of hearing, picking up a phone, making a phone call is a very scary thing to do. Um, and just so loaded. And it was, it, you know, it took me a while to realize that my some of my surgical colleagues and some of my other colleagues didn't realize what that carried for me. And so for me, sending a halo message <laughs> or a diagnosed message was that was me picking up the phone, you know, or getting to a place where I'm not, you know, in the middle of the ICU and I can talk to a consultant. Um, uh, but I think directly um, addressing it uh, with kindness, because I realize, you know, people know what they know. And if they've not had any even temporary disability or know anyone, um, you know, personally who has it, uh, they don't know the the struggle, the daily, you know, extra work that, you know, some of us have to do just to be able to do the same things everyone else is doing. Um, and one of the things that I found really helpful was allyship amongst my colleagues, um, because they knew they I, because I was so open um, and honest about it. Um, you know, if someone's calling me out about something in a meeting, big, you know, and like a direct, you know, uh, derogative statement about something about me not being able to hear, you know, I had 10 people stepping up to the plate and saying, hey, you know, you can't say that to Ashna, you know, or, th or this is not, you know, this is off topic, like we need to table this and go to the next thing. So I, I, the allyship has really um, helped um, uh, in, in, in thus far in my career, um, every environment that I've been to. Uh, and that's not something you just necessarily know that you have when you go to a place. Um, I think that's something that, you know, we, we were able to create because of um, being open. But I get, I get it that it's not always easy to do. And I know when I started the journey, it wasn't the same as where I am now. 
with it. Um, that evolution that I think a lot of the ladies have mentioned, um, you know, here, um, that happens a time and we're always at a different place, I think, with it. But um, that has been really helpful in kind of breaking down some of these implicit biases that I at least get from colleagues. And with patients, I think it's just continuous reinforcement. And, you know, they, 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 they know that you care and they can feel that you care, um, uh, you know, despite all the other things that are going on. And I think that in the end wins everybody over. So there have been several questions in the chat that are kind of related to the same theme about uh, whether our disabilities and chronic illnesses limited the hours that we were able to work as residents. Um, I really wanna expand on that and also kind of think about how our disabilities might have affected the hours that we're able to work even when we're in practice. Um, and I know that that's kind of a, when um, I started to answer a little bit in the chat, I can provide a little bit of my own experience with that. Um, someone also asked a question about whether I specifically had to extend my training because of, you know, limited hours. Um, I'm lucky in that I didn't um, because it just so happened that I had saved a bunch of vacation time and front loaded my schedule and happened to get diagnosed after I had done a lot of my inpatient service requirements. Um, so I was able to really kind of do a lot of electives and a lot of a reintegration back into the clinical service after several of my doctors kind of decided that it was okay for me to be able to do so. Um, but it definitely limited the hours that I was able to be on call safely when I first started to return. Um, so um, I had a lot of uh, fatigue post-stroke. Um, I got a lot of severe migraines um, after everything happened. And if I wasn't sleeping, I was just not really functional. So I had to work with my program directors. And then it was a lot of disclosure with my ICU attendings in particular about how I needed to kind of do shifts. Um, luckily, by that point in time, our call schedule had kind of shifted to more of a night float system. Um, so the way that it was kind of developed, and I'm so glad that I had people that were kind of being my champions, uh, because I don't think I would have had the power to do this myself. But they just kind of, there was an understanding that I'm going to work X amount of hours. That's it. That's all. I have got to be out before rounds, um, because I just physically was not able to keep up. Um, so... When I was in uh, residency or when I was in my child neurology training a couple of years later, by that point in time, my fatigue was much improved. I was much better uh, able to handle some of the longer days, but I still struggled. Um, right now, I would say that my disabilities are mostly invisible unless I'm very tired, in which case I start limping, my dysarthria gets worse, and I start um, really having some other kind of bodily issues. So that, you know, uh, required a lot of disclosure as well, particularly when I was on busy services like the consult service. Um, or um, some of the ICU services as well, where I'd have to talk with my attending, kind of tell them the situation. And I am so, so lucky to have been in the program that I was in because there were people who just kind of understood because they had migraines or they had neurological conditions or one of my attendings uh, knew about my sleep apnea and saw me after hours one day or after I wasn't supposed to be there and like basically was like cussing me out, like get out of here, go home. You have got to take care of yourself. Um, so I think a lot, I just happened to be in a place where I was supported. Um, so even for those days where I did have our restrictions, it was something that was understood and accepted. But if people have other thoughts about that, um, particularly in training, but even also in practice, and in practice, I have so much more flexibility now um, where I can make my schedule so that I know exactly how many hours I can work comfortably. Um, but at the same time, uh, my colleagues even now know, so we're on call um, uh, seven days a week or for a seven week, uh, seven day a week stretch. And it can be a little difficult, especially when you're not sleeping for several days in a row. Um, if the resident's not sleeping, I'm not sleeping when we're on call. Um, but I'm lucky in that I have uh, colleagues who we kind of have an informal backup system so that if something happens, you're too exhausted to take call. Um, you're just too exhausted to function really, someone else is more than willing to step in. I was, oh, my page. Go ahead, Jen. Go, Jen. I, I was just going to add, you know, I, I just, I want to share that um, sort of like, don't do what I did back back in my residency days um, advice, because I was very afraid to ask for any 
decrease in time. And this was before the 80 hour work week restriction. So we were working a hundred hours more, maybe a week, depending on what rotation I was on. And I, um, I, I actually had my program director at times say like, are you, you know, can we do anything to support you? Are you doing okay? And I was like, no, 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 I got this. I'm doing this. Well, I ended up um, driving my hip and completely got locked, woke up one morning after a shift in the ER and couldn't walk and had to be out for three months waiting to get a new hip and then getting the hip and then recovering. And so ended up having to take extra time to complete my residency. Um, but, but I, so, so I guess all I can share is that I think if, I would hope that if you have a conversation with your program director, hopefully you're in a a supported environment where they, you know, they they want you to be successful. I mean, it should be in their best interest. So I guess um, don't do what I did and 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 listen to your body and and take the time that you need because the the end goal is to become a physician in the end, right? And to get to your goal, and you don't have to do that on the same timeline as everyone else. And I'll just add one other thing that. I actually had a peer in fellowship who ended up taking, I mean, a, a tremendous amount of uh, decreased call because of family issues, because of childcare and going through divorce. And I remember thinking, wow, like I, I never, you know, I was afraid to ask for any, you know, changes because of my physical disability and, and she was able to get accommodations um, for, for family issues. So it just, I, I think it reminded me that like, you know, we all have special circumstances and it's okay to, to have that conversation. I think that's really well said. I mean, in my, my residency, I was probably more like Jen. I was like, I got it. I got it. I got it. And my program actually said, no, you don't. And we're going to space out your call. Cause we see that you're limping more. You're falling down the stairs. Like I wasn't really pulling it all together. Um, I got lucky. And I think that is sort of that reading the room and kind of picking a program that you think will forgive when you, and you shouldn't be forgiven. That's the crazy thing, but we'll understand and we'll try to help you. Um, I think for me as an adult, as an adult, like full on faculty member, it's been harder now, I think, to ask for accommodations. And I think, I mean, I never asked for them before. I was always just sort of given them when I unraveled, but to ask for them now as an adult, it is hard. And I think what I try to tell myself is sit up straight, recognize what, I have tried what I've done so far that I have earned a reputation as being a hardworking person and then just put it out there. And like Jennifer was saying, people don't, you know, if a, if a, fem if a, if a parent needs help for childcare, we're all like, oh, okay, of course, we're all in pediatrics. We want to support you. We're not necessarily all of us, but we're all in medicine. We want to support individuals with things like that. It shouldn't be any different with this. And interestingly, often disability is a medically driven condition. Like there is something physiologically that is different it shouldn't be that this is hard to ask for, but it is. And I would just say, sit up straight and take advantage of the work that's been done by a lot of people here to have that path already have been a little bit cleared. I may be the one person who did actually ask for preferential scheduling and residency and fellowship. Um, I, I did not know that that was unique. I, I knew I needed it after med school. I made it through my third year of um, medical school, sort of uh, living on a prayer. I had one of my hips replaced as a fourth year medical student, which was very challenging to schedule and almost delayed me um, graduating. So then in residency, and, and in part because I, I was in a program similar to it sounds like Paige, yay peeps, um, that was very supportive. Um, I went to the chief residence and was like, all right, I need a schedule that um, spaces out my inpatient months. Um, I need a reasonable amount of call, um, which by this point, there were some work hour restrictions, not quite the 80 hour, but there was some restrictions. Um, and I found that they were able to accommodate me. Being in a bigger program, I will say, at least for me, was really helpful, especially when it came time to get my other hip done. It was not that big of a deal to switch my ICU months. Um, and I have heard from mentees that that may or may not be harder in a smaller program. I do agree that it's harder to have that conversation with your boss as an attending. So in an effort to get through some more questions, there's another theme that popped out as I'm reading through these questions. And that was, how do you deal with times when you've maybe asked for an accommodation or asked for help and perhaps that accommodation was declined or you were told you didn't need them. And I know, Jennifer, you mentioned kind of one of them. Um, has anybody else had any experiences 
um, especially if you if uh, some people mentioned feeling like they were turned down more often if they had an invisible disability. Though I'm I'm not sure that's true, and I want to um, kind of state that I know some some people in the questions have said they felt perhaps an invisible disability is turned down more often. Um, again, I don't know that I I know that to be true. I'm I'm just uh, reading what what people are feeling in their questions. I think for me, you know, um, not having that invisible, the disability I had, um, you know, as I went along the various training pathways and then attending ship, uh, you know, they every time employee health makes me fill out a, am I fit to be a physician and to, you know, do my duties, which drives me just the semantics, the language is very important to, you know, I think it should for everyone, but especially is triggering for me. Um, and so I had that conversation with the whatever HR person I, you know, talked to, um, but then I asked to speak to their manager um, and I talked to the head of HR directly now. Um, and I say that it's not that I'm not, you know, capable of, you know, you know, doing my responsibilities or performing my responsibilities. It's that I required these accommodations. And my audiologist has been fantastic. Um, you know, we, we worked together for several years. And so she has a pre-populated letter that she, you know, has tailored towards, you know, this is what Dr. Singh does. You know, we, we've worked together on this program for the, you know, stethoscope. We worked together with Roger and Mike's. We've worked together with these things and provides that to them. And then they, you know, it shuts it down. <laughs> Um, but it's unfortunate that every single time I go somewhere new that I have to, you know, redo the same thing. Um, now I've done it so many times. I know um, what's, exp you know, what, unfortunately, I have not yet encountered a place, um, you know, enlightened enough not to be just saying these things or throwing these things our way. Um, but, you know, I realize it's it's just that slow, you know, we're, we're going to change it. We're going to move the pendulum. Um, and eventually this will not be so novel to, um, you know, HR and to GME and, and to employee health. But that's what I've done. I've not been, you know, I, I will say I've been lucky in that I've never been turned down. You know, I'm, I'm only three months into this new job and we have still, we're still working on figuring out some of the accommodations, you know, some things aren't working and I'm, you know, going back and forth and we're, we're, continuously evaluate reevaluating that but um but I've never been turned down so I've I've you know been very um you know I think like Dr. Arnold was I, I can't imagine them even saying something like you know a $30 stool is not okay that's so ridiculous but yeah I haven't been turned down yet but I've also just been very persistent um so one recommendation I would just like to make is sometimes and definitely earlier on um I may have like had the mindset that, you know, once you get a decision from someone um, that kind of like that's law, that's the end of it. Um, whether it's, you know, applying for accommodations for testing, um, it, other different things, um, just um, not being of the initial mind that, that an initial denial means just stop right there. To me, that's a call to then um, get more advice and mentorship from others um, because I, I feel like earlier it's just like oh okay you say you if you say I don't need this then that must mean I don't need it and because I didn't have any other like past experience to to suggest otherwise but um, the one thing I would pass on is that like you know if if anyone runs into those issues initially um, that's the time that you have to start um, reaching out to and, and looking into things and, and um, advocates that may be able to help you and have a little bit more knowledge and experience of what you have you might have in navigating those situations. Well, thank you. Oh, I think that's all the time that we have for today. I'm going to pass it back to uh, Dr. Meeks just to give some closing remarks. But um, I do want to give a huge thank you not only to all of you guys who joined us today, um, but to our wonderful panelists, you guys have shared um, very personal and really moving nuggets of advice and stories. And I just want to thank you so much for being willing to share that all with us. 
Thank you so much to the panels, my friends, my colleagues. You know how much I adore you. Your advice was amazing. And um, we will continue this conversation in some way, shape, or form with our audience. This will be posted for further viewing, and it will also be moved into a podcast episode. So you can share this with your friends and they can listen to um, the panel in their car, on their walk. Um, in whatever way they see possible. I want to make sure that you've received the link that I have and the many links that we've put in the chat um, and, and direct you definitely to the Mutual Mentorship Program um, through Stanford. I put that link in there as well. And I will also be emailing you, you know, these, these, women with disabilities in medicine are going through their career and going through their past. And we like to support them with a letter thanking them formally for being on this panel and your comments in the feedback and you participating in the feedback is one mechanism of helping us write a formal letter for their promotions committee. So please, please, please do fill out that survey when it comes to you or grab the, um, grab the link now. And I see that our very generous panelists are sending out their, um, email addresses. And so be sure to reach out to them if you're looking for some assistance. And I just want to take a moment to say that so many of these incredible women have written their stories and shared their stories in academic and non-academic venues. And for those of you who are joining us today and thinking, gosh, I, I don't know if I have a story to tell. I don't know if my story would be impactful. I promise you it will. Um, please do sit down. You don't have to be a writer to do this. You don't have to take hours and hours to do this. Use voice memo, use whatever way feels comfortable for you. We do have some funding to help people with disabilities tell their stories. So if you would like a little bit more structured mechanism for crafting your story, um, I think we've helped um, bring many of these stories to the literature and we would love to help you. So just reach out to our organization, Docs with Disabilities. And then as a final note, I just wanna say um, that our thoughts and our prayers as an organization and as a panel are with the family and the friends of Andreas Galejos. And, and we've lost some pretty incredible disability, um, just some, some pretty incredible disability folks um, this year, um, Judy Human as well. And so for those of you who are new to this or may not be aware, um, these people have paved the pathway for all of us to be here and, and to be having this conversation. And so we need you, we need more allies, we need accomplices, we need more people with disabilities doing this work so that we can continue their good work, um, honor their work and their names and um, continue to create a more accessible medical education and training environment. So we hope you'll continue to join us. We have, uh, we found out yesterday that we're going to be funded to continue these panels. And so we'll be doing one, I know, so excited on nursing, one on allied health, um, looking especially at psychologists who do this work. So if you're on your psychologist with a disability, you know we're coming to ask you to be on this panel or a nurse. Um, and then we're looking to do something for residents and medical students as well. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much to Alice and Kessler and Diana Sihas for their an, an incredible leadership um, of this Women with Disabilities in Medicine mentorship program. And to all of our mentors, those that are with us today and those who couldn't be with us today, and all of our mentees, we're so grateful you're part of our community. We appreciate you all. And have a lovely evening.